Early voting getting started in Arizona, a crucial battleground state here in the West. Both of the campaigns sending their vice presidential nominees to try to get out the vote. Close down this border. That is the way to show compassion for the American people. And that's what Donald Trump and I are going to do. Our allies don't believe they can trust the former president. They don't believe that we will... And good evening, everyone. Welcome to West Coast Wrap. I'm Alex Savage. On the same day that early voting gets started in Arizona, the presidential campaigns were out in force in that state, appealing to voters across the toss-up state of Arizona. Today, Senator J.D. Vance was in Tucson talking about issues at the southern border. He also took part in a town hall discussion in Mesa and then held a rally in Tucson. That rally happened at the same time as Governor Tim Walz hosted an event with veterans and their families in Chandler. He later met with the Gila River Indian community and tribal leaders. During their stops, each candidate took swipes at the presidential nominees on the other side. Fundamentally, what Kamala Harris is trying to do is take policies that have been tried by Marxist governments in South America and Central America and bring them to the United States of America. And I think a lot of Latinas are saying our family came here to get away from this stuff, not to lean into it. And that's exactly what Donald Trump is going to do. Prevent that from coming here. We understand, and I think you've seen Vice President be part of the Biden-Harris administration, that doesn't just understand sovereignty, they honor sovereignty. They understand what it means for our sovereign nations. They understand what it means when our first, uh, the first uh, people on this land and what it means on those relationships to make, get them right. Our allies don't believe they can trust the former president. Senator Vance is continuing his visit to the West with a stop in the San Francisco Bay Area. This was the scene this afternoon as supporters lined the streets of Woodside, where he's set to make an appearance at a campaign fundraiser tonight. Tickets to that fundraiser cost at least $3,300 per person. Back in Arizona, a debate happening tonight in the heated race for U.S. Senate there. Democrat Ruben Gallego and Republican Kerry Lake are meeting in Phoenix tonight for the one and only debate of this race. Congressman Gallego has a lead in most of the recent polls against Lake, a former TV anchor. She gained national attention for her strong support of former President Trump, backing his unfounded claims of fraud in the 2020 election. Reproductive rights and immigration have been some of the top issues in that race. We'll have more on that race in a moment here. For more on this huge role that Arizona is playing in the election, we are joined live tonight by Samara Klar, who's a professor of political science at the University of Arizona. Professor, we appreciate the time tonight. Obviously, a huge day and a huge week for the state of Arizona. A lot of focus on this battleground state. In the next couple of days, we're going to see both the presidential candidates and their running mates making stops in Arizona. What does all of that signal about just how important it is to win Arizona and its 11 electoral votes? Yeah, I mean, every week in Arizona feels like it's been a huge week since the 2020 election, frankly. We are such a closely divided state. The Every poll I'm seeing here in Arizona shows neither candidate outside the margin of error. So it's incredibly close. Not surprising that both campaigns are here this week, and I imagine we'll be seeing a lot more of them until Election Day. I mean, early voting started today, and there's a big push here in Arizona by both campaigns. All right, what are we hearing in terms of the messaging that the campaigns are trying to use here in the closing weeks in Arizona to reach those voters out there who may still be undecided? Well, you know, the three big issues in Arizona are the economy, the border, and abortion. And I think voters here in Arizona understand for the most part, how Harris and Trump differ on the issue of abortion. Right now, Harris is really trying to come out very strong on the border, trying to show that the Democrats are willing to be just as tough on the border as the Republicans. Both campaigns talking about the economy and trying to convince Arizona voters that they are the campaign that will possibly improve cost of living, improve salary over time. So we have strong messaging from all three campaigns on all three issues. Yeah, and it's interesting. We should point this out for the viewers, but Arizona voters not only will weigh in on the presidential race, but there are also a couple of important ballot measures they will weigh in on. One of them is a tough immigration enforcement measure that will be put to voters in November, uh, as well as a ballot measure that would enshrine the right to an abortion in the state's constitution. How do you see those two measures motivating certain uh, parts of the electorate and potentially affecting the outcome of the presidential race? 
Sure. Well, the abortion ballot measure was the first to make it onto the ballot. They had their uh, signatures gathered throughout the summer. That has largely been seen as a measure that could increase mobilization among liberal leaning voters who might support Democratic candidates. The immigration ballot measure was a later addition, possibly by an effort by the Republican Party to help out some of the Republican candidates. Both measures are popular. I mean, we could end up with a situation where both abortion and this uh, this uh, immigration measure pass. The abortion measure, of course, would protect the right to abortion in the state of Arizona. The immigration measure is more of a conservative leading policy, which would give state law enforcement the right to arrest and and uh, prosecute Im uh, immigrants who arrive unlawfully into the state. Uh, you know, if we can step back for just a moment here for some perspective on, on Arizona and the politics there. I mean, this was once yeah. a, a firmly held uh, Republican state here, but it has obviously shifted, as we know, to a toss up state in recent years. President Biden in 2020, I don't have to tell you, he won the state by fewer than 11,000 votes at that time. How has the influx of, of, of transplants from a lot of the neighboring states here in this part of the country, especially California, sort of shifted the views of the electorate in Arizona? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question. I mean, as you say, Arizona was reliably Republican for a long time. What we've seen over the last 10 or 20 years really are Republicans winning Arizona at decreasing margins, meaning that Republican victories were getting smaller and smaller over time. We were seeing Republican candidates go from winning by 10 percentage points to 5 percentage points to 2020, where Biden won by 0 0.36 percentage points. So it really has been this linear downward trend, not only for our presidential elections, but also for statewide elections. We currently have a Democratic governor. We have two senators who won as Democrats. We have a Democratic attorney general. So Arizona is looking pretty blue these days. Now, whether that has to do with um, immigration from around the country is a good question. We do see a lot of people moving here from California, from Washington State, from from the Northeast. If you look at the demographics of Arizona, though, the registration numbers haven't shifted all that much. So today you have about 36 percent of voters who identify as Republican and about 29 percent who identify as Democrat. And that's pretty much what we've always seen. So it's a little pretty interesting that the registration numbers are quite stable. The only group that really has increased over time are independents. So that could be playing a big role in these shifting electoral outcomes. But we're also seeing a lot of domestic migration, people moving from rural counties to urban counties. And that also has a big, plays a big factor here in Arizona. All right. Before we go, Professor, I do want to get your take on that hotly contested Senate race we mentioned there a moment ago between the Republican Carrie Lake and the Democrat Ruben Gallego. They are holding their one and only debate happening in Phoenix tonight. What is at stake in that race in terms of, uh, you know, the balance of power in the Senate? Sure. Well, you know, this is a race that obviously both parties want to win, but Gallego is probably pe feeling pretty comfortable right now. He's had a sizable lead in most polls uh, for the duration of this campaign, and Lake has had unsuccessful elections before in Arizona. So it's looking as though Gallego may have enough possibly to win that seat. And what we're seeing that here is more support for Gallego in Arizona than we are for Harris. That's what we saw in 2020 as well. Mark Kelly, our Democratic senator, won with more votes than Biden did. So the state level Democratic candidates are actually substantially more popular in Arizona than national level Democrats. All right. Well, we appreciate your perspective tonight. That is Samara Klar from the University of Arizona's Political Science Department. Thank you so much for weighing in tonight. We appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. All right. Vice President Kamala Harris has arrived in Nevada tonight, another key battleground state here in the West. She will be spending the night in Las Vegas ahead of two rallies focused on Latino voters. Tomorrow, she's expected to take part in a town hall being hosted by Univision. She is also expected to talk about a new initiative that will focus directly on Latino men and talk to them about the stakes of this election. Earlier today, the vice president was focused on the hurricane response. President Biden and I and our administration will continue to do everything we can to protect the people who have been in the path of this storm. And once the storm has passed, we will be there to help folks recover and rebuild. Vice President Harris also plans to visit Phoenix tomorrow. The details on that visit have not yet been made public. Today, former President Trump added another stop on his upcoming tour of the West. He's planning to hold a rally in Reno this Friday night. Earlier that day, he'll make a speech about immigration policy in Aurora, Colorado. On Saturday, the president will join a roundtable discussion with Latino voters in Las Vegas. He's also holding a rally in Coachella, California, just outside of Palm Springs. And then on Sunday, another rally planned in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Today, he campaigned in Pennsylvania, fueling rumors about the ongoing hurricane response.
And we have another big one coming in, but the worst, the one in North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Virginia, it was uh, pieces of Florida got hit. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, worst, the worst ever, they say. They had no money. You know where they gave the money? To illegal immigrants. Now, President Biden pushed back and blasted the former president's comments, saying they are full of lies and disinformation. Quite frankly, these lies are un-American, and there is simply no place for them. Not now, not ever. Former President Trump has led this onslaught of lies. Assertions have been made that property is being confiscated. That's simply not true. They're saying people impacted by these storms will receive $750 in cash and no more. That is simply not true either. And as we've been telling you, West Coast crews are ready to help out the hurricane victims, the victims of Hurricane Milton. Let's get you a live look tonight. This is Tampa, Florida, where the hurricane is lashing that region with strong winds and heavy rain. You can see it in this shot. Milton just made landfall a short time ago, just south of Sarasota. It was a Category 3 storm as it came ashore. It's expected to remain a hurricane even as it crosses over the Florida Peninsula. Now, a San Francisco Bay Area company is using a drone to help scientists gather more information about this storm. And look at this video taken from what they call their sail drone. This was posted to social media today, and it shows Milton's violent waves, some of them more than 28 feet high. These images were captured about 40 miles from the eye of the storm. And more firefighters based here in the West are headed to Florida to help out with the hurricane response. Colorado's Task Force One shared these images of the team packing up for today's deployment from Denver. They're heading over to Fort Blanding, which is right outside of Gainesville. That's where other Colorado first responders are already positioned to help in the response to Milton. For the latest on this storm, I want to bring in KTVU meteorologist Mark Tamayo. Mark, you have been uh, tracking the, the path of this storm. Now it has made landfall. What, what can you tell us about where Milton came ashore. Well, just south of uh, Sarasota, as, as you mentioned, and I, I will say just the, the conditions are just overwhelming the area. Th these are my little scribble notes, and look at that top number there. Can you read that? Just over five feet. Uh, no. Yeah, five feet. Five, full five inches. Five inches, five beg inches. your pardon. Yeah, <laughs> 5.09 inches in one hour for St. Petersburg, Florida um, wow. with, with this storm. Wow. So that's how much rain that they are getting. Uh, that's when you have to factor in the winds and the storm surge. So we'll talk about the landfall right now as we take a look at the graphics for you. Uh, the landfall, if you can't see, south of Tampa. It happened 8.30 Eastern time with winds of 120 miles an hour, a Category 3 storm. And right now it has weakened to a Category 2, as you would expect, moving on land with winds of 110 miles an hour. But, of course, the, the big deal, well, here's the forecast track as we take this into well, your Thursday and eventually into Friday, moving out into the Atlantic uh, over the next few days. But hurricane warnings, tropical storm warnings in place. The rainfall is just excessive. as we're, uh, We already talked about that. Isolated amounts could be up to 18 inches. And what's happening right now is the storm surge, some very dangerous levels, 9 to 13 feet potentially. And just to give you some perspective with that, just a house and a property here, you can see the ocean surge and those levels really going up. And Alex, it's not just the, uh, the amount of water, it's the force of the water. And then when you right. think about all the leftover debris from Helene, that can cause some more dangerous, uh, dangerous yeah. conditions out there as and well. That, and that's the big concern. And we know, and you have always talked about the fact that storm surge is, is really the huge threat when it comes to you know, causing yeah. damage and, and threatening the lives of people in those communities. When does the storm surge reach its peak tonight? Probably over the next uh, few hours, uh, uh, overnight, well, late tonight into early tomorrow morning. But I, I will say, you know, it's darkness right now, so it's hard to survey all the damage. So probably for First light tomorrow morning, we'll get get a better idea of just the scope of just how catastrophic th this could be, unfortunately. Yeah, a lot of concern about the yeah. devastation we could see come tomorrow. Okay, uh, KTV meteorologist Mark Tamayo, appreciate that, yeah. Mark. Thank you. Up next here on West Coast Wrap tonight, entertainment mogul Sean Diddy Combs wants more clarity on the future of his sex trafficking case. Coming up, the request his lawyers made in court today. Also, a small plane crash leaves one California island community devastated tonight. So the neighbors were all crying.
Boeing says it has withdrawn its latest offer in union contract negotiations with its factory workers. The offer would have given members 30 percent raises over four years. The union says members overwhelmingly rejected that offer. The most recent proposal was more generous than the last one workers rejected back on September 13th when they first went on strike. The union also lamented last month that Boeing publicized its latest offer before actually bargaining with union negotiators. The union's original ask was 40 percent raises over three years. Five people were killed when a twin engine plane went down off the Southern California coast. This crash happened last night right after takeoff on Catalina Island, which is southwest of Los Angeles, about 30 miles from the coast of Long Beach. Reporter Matthew Seedorf from Fox 11 spoke to neighbors who know the pilot. Authorities on Catalina Island working to recover the bodies of five people killed in a plane crash. What happened? I don't know, but there's nobody in the hospital. Neighbors of one of the victims Wednesday visibly shaken. He was a pilot. He taught people. Wonderful human being. Great father. It's very sad. This is a confirmed twin engine aviation incident. We have uh, several victims that are deceased. The Beechcraft Baron twin engine plane took off from Catalina Buffalo Springs Airport around 8 Tuesday evening, crashing less than a minute later within a mile. Apparently there's a sensor on the iPhone when there's a, a, a hard bump or something like that where it, it gives you an alert tone. Apple iPhone crash detection alerting L.A. County deputies. About 10 o'clock. Um, in the area where the alert tone was, we ended up locating a downed aircraft. All five people on the plane confirmed dead. The aircraft tail number coming back to Ali Safai. He was always very welcoming to everyone that came into the flight school. A note posted at Santa Monica Airport says that Safai ran a flight school that closed five years ago. He was just super kind old soul and yeah. he just loved helping people. He was going to help me a little bit on some ground mm -hmm. stuff and he was just very nice person. It was clear. Um, obviously, the coastal fog comes in later in the evening. Oliver Pelhamburn flew into the airport just hours before the crash. So if you land on runway 22, you're landing uphill. The runway on top of a 1,600-foot mountain. Airport is closed at night and when it's unattended, and it lists the unattended time as past 5 p.m. However, I know there are exceptions to that. All upset. The neighbors were all crying. You see this on the news, you never think it's going to be your neighbor. And that was Fox 11's Matthew Seedorf reporting tonight from Southern California. The NTSB tonight is investigating the cause of that deadly plane crash. Today, lawyers for Sean Diddy Combs said they want to move forward with a trial on those sex trafficking charges in the spring. In a letter sent to the judge in this case, Combs attorneys said they would prefer the trial start in either April or May. Combs has pleaded not guilty to charges he physically and sexually abused women for years. New York prosecutors say they will be available for a trial, but they did not specify when they would like it to start. I talked earlier with TMZ's Charles Ladaboudier about the latest legal maneuvering in this case. What uh, we had heard from them is they would rather get this started sooner than later because they really don't believe that the feds have all their ducks in a row and that they are still investigating, trying to pull together um, evidence that they would bring in trial. So Diddy's team feels like if they get in court faster, that's going to help him. And Combs has remained behind bars ever since his arrest back on September 16th. This week, his legal team filed a motion with the Court of Appeals in Manhattan seeking to have him released on bond leading up to his trial. Drone video posted online shows how fall foliage is peaking in some parts of the West. These images of trees with leaves changing to hues of orange and yellow were captured northwest of Salt Lake City. Late September into early October is usually when fall foliage peaks in northern Utah. Let's bring our meteorologist from KTVU, Mark DeMaio, back into the picture here to uh, talk about the weather across the West. And we are seeing a shift to cooler conditions. Yeah, that's right, Alex, across a good portion of the West. Not everywhere just yet, but still we're starting to see a weather pattern change that is bringing in some cooler air. You can see some highs from today, some triple digits out toward Arizona, Palm Springs 104, Burbank in the upper 80s, and Sacramento no longer the triple digits, 86 degrees this afternoon. So some parts are cooling off. You can uh, see on the satellite some high clouds drifting over Northern California and also some fog. So the Bay Area has cooled off quite a bit compared to just two days ago. As you can pick out right now, some clouds and maybe a little bit of shower activity in portions of Arizona. 
and then up in the uh, Seattle area, some clouds passing on on through and a little bit of activity on the radar over the uh, past few hours. And there's some more cloud cover out here in the Pacific. This was Seattle today with the sun cloud mix. In fact, lots of clouds showing up in this picture. 61 degrees in uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area. This is from the Oakland area looking out towards San Francisco. Some cloud cover there. Temperatures in the lower 60s and in Phoenix. We showed you some of the high clouds in the satellite. They're showing up on the, with this camera as well. 106 degrees so the triple digit heat continues for Phoenix once again. Right now Phoenix has cooled off to 99. It's 92 in Las Vegas. Uh, it looks like Los Angeles is 63 degrees and up in Portland, Oregon reporting 64. So here's the overall weather story tomorrow. We are expecting clearing skies for Seattle temperatures in the 60s. Some patchy fog for San Francisco. The, the, the heat from two days ago is just out of the Bay Area. San Francisco remember two days ago in the 90s. Tomorrow only in the 60s. Los Angeles will be in the low 80s and then it looks like a nice sunny warm day for Denver and the heat continues out toward Phoenix. Some more cities for you up and down the West Coast as you can see for parts of Washington temperatures in the 60s. San Jose in the Bay Area upper 70s. Santa Clarita in Southern California 92 and Scottsdale Arizona once again up above 100 degrees. We are starting to see some changes though develop in terms of with the overall weather pattern. There's this system out here in the Pacific. This could be approaching Northern California sometime late Friday and into Saturday. So with that, there's a slight chance of some shower activity for San Francisco and especially for the northern parts of the state. So we'll keep an eye on that over the next few days. As you can see up in Seattle, temperature is 60s could be approaching 70 degrees by Saturday. No big changes for San Francisco, Los Angeles tomorrow in the lower 80s. Out toward Denver, 84 degrees tomorrow, 106 in Phoenix. And we'll, we'll continue to keep an eye on the changing weather pattern out in the Pacific as we do head into, well, we are in the fall, but over the next step, mm -hmm. coming days, we could be talking about some more changes as well, Alex. All right, we'll keep an eye on it, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Coming up tonight here on West Coast Wrap, a legendary resort on the Las Vegas Strip wiped off the map in seconds. Tonight, the explosive early morning send off to the Tropicana Hotel and Casino. Quite a sight, an iconic Las Vegas hotel gone in just seconds. After almost 67 years on the strip, the Tropicana came down at around 2.30 this morning in a historic implosion and fireworks show. Before closing its doors back in April, it was the third oldest casino on the Vegas Strip. The implosion this morning was the first the city has seen in over a decade, and it clears land for a planned $1.5 billion stadium that is expected to be the home of the A's as they leave Oakland. Finally tonight, scientists are deploying new seismic sensors to the largest active volcano in Washington state amid some unusual earthquake activity. Those sensors will allow scientists to get a better picture of what's happening under the volcano. Mount Adams usually experiences an earthquake every two to three years, but in September alone, it had six recorded earthquakes. Mount Adams is considered a high risk volcano. However, scientists say there is no evidence an eruption is brewing. And that does it for West Coast Wrap tonight. We appreciate you watching as always, and you can stay up to date on all the big stories we're covering across the West at our website. That's westcoastwrap.com. Have a great rest of your night.